Okay, so good morning, everybody. And first of all, I want to join the other speakers in thanking the organizers for the invitation. And I also want to thank the previous speaker for uh, agreeing to, to, to swap uh, talks. Um, I mean, this morning was a bit crazy. I had the, my second shot of a <clears throat> COVID vaccine. And then there is the uh, Giro d'Italia, this famous uh, bicycle uh, race which is just crossing Florence. And so everything is paralyzed. So it was a bit of a logistic uh, nightmare this morning. Anyway, so I'm here now and I hope uh, I can uh, uh, entertain you for, for a while. And what I'm going to, uh, well, I'm going to start uh, by thanking also the people who have been working with me. I'm a bit envious of uh, most of the previous speakers where they show, uh, when they show these large groups full of uh, people and we are, a very small group and uh, we are essentially just four people uh, so these are the people working with me so Alessandro Zavatta is a colleague a researcher uh, Nicola is a postdoc and uh, one of the main responsible for the results that I'm going to show you today uh, Luca has just left the group so he's no longer with us and Saverio has just joined the group and so I don't I still don't have a picture of him to, 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 to show you uh, we are in uh, in Florence, Italy, and uh, we come from National Institute of Optics of the National Research Council of Italy, and in a sort of current superposition of different institutes for University of uh, Florence and uh, LENS, which is the European Laboratory for Nonlinear Spectroscopy. And uh, we received uh, support from some organization, and I would like uh, especially to mention this uh, Quantera program, and uh, in which, I mean, in the 2019 uh, edition of this Quantera program, we are uh, together with some of the uh, let's say members of this non Gauss uh, collaboration uh, in, in the same uh, Quantera project, which is named Shock. So, what I'm going to tell you about is the following. So, we'll, uh, I'm going to, 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 to give a short, uh, let's say, overview of what we are doing in Florence, but mostly I'm going to concentrate on uh, the possibility of entangle, um, entangling. Uh, uncorrelated and possibly classical and microscopic life states uh, in a let's say, simple way. Uh, how we are going to do this is by using, let's say, the tools that we have developed uh, along the years and along several years now. And especially, uh, I'm going to tell you about this uh, coherent multimode single photon addition. And uh, so, this is how we generate uh, this uh, kind of entanglement. And how we detect it is by means of this uh, mode selective of modern detection and then performing uh, complete uh, tomographic reconstruction of the states that we produce. And why we do this? Uh, well, mostly because uh, most of the states that we generate, generate and of the processes that we implement have some fundamental interest in the field of, let's say, quantum physics and quantum optics in particular. And then also because uh, some of the processes and some of the states that we uh, implement can be used for resources for quantum information processing, sensing, and communication. Okay. So let me start to, to say how we can generate entanglement. So the, let's say, simplest way to generate entanglement is to, 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 to take a single photon, just a single photon, and shine it onto a 50% mean splitter. So what comes out, I mean, uh, uh, you have two alternative possibilities. This photon can be either reflected or transmitted, and you have this indistinguishability between the two uh, amplitudes for the two processes. And so what you get is a coherent superposition of the photon being both transmitted and reflected. But you can write in this, uh, this way here. So in this form, you have a, a so-called a single photon path entangled state. So essentially, we're just sharing a single photon between two spatial modes, in this case, A and B, uh, entangles them, okay? Uh, actually, this is not what we want to do in this, uh, uh, in, in this line of, uh, in, in, in the course of this uh, presentation, uh, because, okay, uh, what you need in this case, you, you have to start from a non-classical state, so single photon, but I mean, if you shine a non-classical state on a mean splitter, you get uh, some entanglement at the output anyway. And then, I mean, in the particular case of a single photon, this is hardly macroscopic. Instead, what we would like to do is to have some, let's say, general way, general method to entangle two arbitrary, even if you start from classical and macroscopic 
states of light and just by, by uh, doing something to them, entangle them. Uh, so I'm going to, to, I can show you some of the tools that we use uh, to, 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 to perform this uh, kind of manipulation of the states. And uh, since we are in Nungo's uh, workshop, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you about this Nungo state engineering uh, that we do on the states. And we do this uh, by means of uh, heralded uh, non gaussian operations. So the first one is uh, someone, something that was uh, already mentioned quite a lot in the, at the beginning of this uh, workshop and is photon subtraction. It, uh, I mean, essentially, this is one of the first uh, examples of photon subtraction uh, performed in the group of Philippe Canger in Paris uh, in 2006. And what they did here is to, to just uh, generate a squeeze vacuum state and then subtract the single photon by means of a low reflectivity bit splitter. And just looking at the click in this uh, single photon detector on the reflected arm. So when you see a click here, essentially you perform this uh, uh, photon subtraction operation on the input state, which in this case was a, a squeezed vacuum state. Uh, and you get uh, and, and you get something else. So in this particular case, if you start from a Gaussian uh, state, already non-classical non state. What by performing photon subtraction, single photon subtraction, you get something which is non-Gaussian. So you dig a hole in the beacon function and you get negativity. So you get something which is even more, let's say, non-classical and uh, it's no longer a Gaussian state of light. So things have moved uh, on quite a lot and during the, these years and you have seen the, mm, okay, uh, let, let me say that we also uh, did this, uh, and uh, by the way, with my chair <laughs> person now, Valentina, when she was in Florence. So we did, we also played quite a lot with photon subtraction, and uh, we did not apply it to do uh, non-classical states to start from, but we, for example, applied it to coherent states, and um, showing that I mean uh, annihilation of single photon from a coherent state does not do anything. And we applied it also to very classical state states of light, like thermal states. And in this case, uh, what you get if you start from a classical state, you don't get non-classicality. You can guess, you can get the non-Gaussianity at the end, and you can get very strange, uh, let's say, uh, unexpected uh, photon statistics. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, if you apply a photon, single photon subtraction from a thermal state, you double the mean number of photons in the, in the thermal state itself. But you don't get non-classicality if you don't start from a non-classical state. Okay, so. In Florence, the main tool instead is this uh, photon addition. And we perform photon addition, heralded photon addition in a, with a little variation from uh, the usual scheme to generate a single photon from spontaneous parametric down conversion. In this case, we use the stimulated parametric down conversion and we shine together with the pump pulse on a parametric crystal. We also shine some seed light along the signal uh, arm. Uh, what happens is that when you see a click in this uh, idler uh, detector here, what you implement is essentially the photon that is added version of the input state on the on the output. Okay, so we can represent it by this sort of a box here. You put any input state in. When you see a click in this herald mode, then what you get out is this uh, photon added version of the input state. So we start did do this uh, many years ago already, and we applied this to coherent states or to uh, thermal states again. And what you what you see, what I want to show you uh, very quickly is that even if you start, for example, from a very classical state of light, like a thermal state, by just adding a single photon, you get something which is no Gaussian and, and non-classical. So you can start from very classical state and, guess, and obtain non-classicality by just adding a single photon. And in this case, this is a coherent state. And uh, as you increase, let's say, the amplitude of initial coherent state, uh, what you get is something that, which is which retains some of the characteristics of both, uh, let's say, the coherent state and of, uh, let's say, a single photon, essentially. So you see that uh, if you start from vacuum and you add a single photon, you get a single photon, which is this one, highly non-classical with clear big negativity. And then as you go to slightly larger uh, coherent states, so you, you get something in between, something which has a clear, let's say, phase dependence, these are bigger functions, but also clear negativity. And as you increase 
the value or the amplitude of this green state, you get something by adding a single photon to it, you get something which is non-classical. You have still some negativity here, but it gets smaller and smaller. Uh, and looks more and more like another coherent state of slightly larger uh, amplitudes. This is something that you have to keep in mind for what I'm going to tell you later, okay? But in all cases, you see that, okay, so you can generate uh, non-classicality even if you start from a classical state. And this non-classicality sort of uh, becomes, let's say, smaller and smaller as you increase the, the size of initial state. So we have been playing with these tools for quite a lot of time. We either by just uh, addition and subtraction by themselves. So we, we can put them in sequences. We can put them into a superposition uh, of, uh, let's say, sequences in different orders. Uh, or we can arrange them in different ways, for example, to generate, uh, to orthogonalize uh, an arbitrary state and generate continuous variable qubits. Or we can implement or emulate some kernel linearities, all of them in a conditional way. And all these kind of uh, results that we got along the years were essentially done, obtained in uh, uh, working always on a single well defined mode uh, of light. So, what if we start moving to, to, to multiple modes, let's say just two to begin with? So, well, we start going multi mode. So, what happens, for example, if you start using uh, a multi mode? Uh, photon subtraction. So you, you want to, you can implement this kind of operation A1 plus A2. Of course, it's not normalized, but it's okay. And uh, mm, and the first time that people did this experimentally was again in a group of Philippe Granchet in uh, Paris. And they started from a Gaussian uh, entangled state. So uh, again, uh, um, this time is, was a two mode squeeze state. And by implementing this queen superposition of photon subtraction, which we did by using two uh, bin splitters of lower effectivity in each mode and combining the, these uh, reflective modes uh, on, uh, on a bin splitter and look at, uh, looking at, uh, uh, at the single photon count after the bin splitter. So they, if I see a click in this detector, they, one cannot know if it came from this one or from the other mode here. So implementing this, what we did was essentially was to, to distill the entanglement of the initial state, okay? So you need to start from a, an entangled state and by means of this coherent superposition of photons and fraction, you can increase, distill the entanglement. And again, things have moved uh, quite a lot in uh, these years. And you have seen a lot of uh, recent works, again, by the group of uh, Valentina and Nicola Treps in Paris, where we're now able to, to, to essentially subtract single photons in very well-defined uh, modes. In this case, they are uh, time frequency modes, and they can subtract photons in coherent superposition of different modes. And uh, so what they find is that they, if they, they, they subtract from single modes, they get this uh, non gaussianity in the in the final state, they can subtract in combinations of uh, different modes. And in, in any case, what I mean, the interesting let's say, results are obtained if you start from something which is already non classical. So you have to start from a set of, a, let's say, squeezed uh, state, and then you get something interesting at the output if you perform this equine superposition of uh, uh, photon subtractions. Okay. So let me mm, just uh, re, re summarize. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of addition and subtraction? You saw, you saw that photon subtraction is very cool, let's say, uh, non Gaussian operations, because if you start from some, something which is non classical and could be a Gaussian state, and you apply single mode photon subtraction, what you get is something which is non classical and non Gaussian in general. And also, if you start from, uh, let's say, two modes, just two modes in this case, um, which are already entangled, and you perform a coherent superposition of photon subtractions, what you get at the end is something which is more entangled than what you started from. So it's very nice, but it cannot, let's say, generate non-classicality in this case of single mode or entanglement in the case of multiple mode by itself. So photon subtraction is uh, cool, but uh, I believe that photon addition is uh, even better because uh, uh, it can generate no classical states, whatever the input. So you just add a single photon, you get no classical states at the output. So you can expect that if you start from also uh, multi-mode states of light, which are not 
let's say, correlated, which are just independent, and you apply this coherence superposition of photon additions, you can get something which is entangled. So it can create both non classicality in the case of single mode and entanglement in the case of multi modes uh, from scratch, essentially. So, how do we perform this uh, coherence superposition of photon additions? We call them the localized photon. We, we call it the localized photon addition. So you remember those boxes I showed you before for photon addition. We can use two of them on two different spatial modes in this case, and you can mix the error mode on a 50% uh, bit splitter and look at the output of at one of the outputs of this uh, splitter. So uh, you may have several possibilities. Uh, well, let's start from vacua as the input at the beginning. So you start just from spontaneous parametric down conversion. So these are two uh, down, conversion, down conversion crystal, parametric down conversion crystals, and you start with uh, vacuum at the input. Uh, so if you see a click in this uh, D1 detector, it could have come from the uh, box one. In that case, you have uh, at the end, you have one photon in mode one and still vacuum in mode two, but it could have come also from uh, mode from the box two on second mode. And the case, in that case, you would have one photon in mode two and vacuum in mode one. Since the two possibilities are made indistinguishable, you have a queen superposition of two and you have an entangled state. This, uh, again, this is a single photon path entangled state, one, zero, zero, one which is exactly what uh, you can get by shining a single photon to a, onto a bit splitter, okay? So anyway, this is the kind of tools that we use and we are going to use them uh, on some states which are a bit more uh, interesting than just vacuum. But, uh, uh, and then, I mean, we are not going to, uh, I'm going to show you these uh, kind of pictures where we two separated, separated spatial modes just for convenience, but we are not going to use them in, in experiments because this uh, kind of, uh, let's say, scheme is not so, I would say, so, not so clear, clever. You need two parametric crystals, you need two homogeneous detectors, so you have to keep everything stable and so on, so it's not very convenient, it's not very clever. And instead, what we do is to use temporal modes. So I didn't tell you, but in our experiments, we use pulsed uh, excitation. So we have uh, pulses coming at a uh, repetition rate fixed by our mod lock laser. And so what we can do, we can use just this one single box uh, for photo addition. And instead of, uh, uh, and instead what we can do is to add uh, two different paths of different length to reach the uh, detector. If uh, this, let's say time difference between these two paths is equal to the time difference and to the inverse of repetition rate of our laser, then seeing a click here doesn't tell you if it came from long, long or short, uh, let's say path. And so you have a equivalent superposition of, the adding, of the having added a single photon either to the first mode or to the second one. And then if you also add some, uh, let's say, variable phase here, what you can implement is this coherent superposition of photon addition on mode one and two with uh, uh, this variable uh, phase for a superposition. So we did this back in 2006 with Valentina. And at the time we didn't talk about photon, uh, the localized photon addition, but we talked just about localized, the localized single photon uh, generation. And then you can also, I mean, also on the detection side, you can simplify things because instead of having many uh, homodyne detectors, detectors in many modes, you can have a single homodyne detector and use it in a sort of time multiplexed uh, fashion. So you use local oscillator pulses, you can individually adjust the phases of the local oscillator pulses. And then this, uh, I mean, and then you time multiplex uh, this homodyne signal to get the quadratures for each separated mode. So this kind of scheme is uh, much more convenient than, than when one using uh, spatial modes and it's in principle scalable to multiple modes. Okay. So, okay, let's talk about uh, um, generating entanglement. So uh, let's go back to some uh, uh, very, uh, well, very, very general quest, uh, idea about the uh, coherent superpositions. Uh, and uh, you know that uh, normally when you uh, talk of a macroscopic uh, uh, 
queen in superposition, you talk about this uh, sort of Schrodinger cat picture, and you have a superposition of two macroscopically distinct state, uh, alive and dead cat. In optics, the closest, uh, let's say, approximation to this is the coherent superposition of uh, a coherent state and a coherent state with the uh, opposite phase. This is the uh, Schrodinger cat in, uh, uh, in quantum optics. And this is a sort of a representation of this kind of state. So it's just a coherent state, a sort of classical state, in a superposition of, of having two opposite phases. Um, if we don't uh, look just at this uh, final step of the superposition, but you look at this intermediate step of the superposition state, where you have, uh, you, you also consider a microscopic uh, atomic sample, which uh, by decaying kills a cat, you have, uh, you need to, to, to enlarge your state, and then you get with this kind of uh, entangled uh, state, which, which is uh, uh, composed of two parts. One, which is essentially microscopic, which is due to the atom being uh, still in its excited or ground state. And the other part, which is microscopic, which is the cut, which, which is alive or dead. And if you want to do something similar in optics, you have to do what you get is uh, something like this. It's a sort of uh, hybrid uh, entangled state where one part is uh, microscopic and the other part is, uh, in principle, can be macroscopic if alpha is large enough. And uh, sort of, uh, let's say, visual representation of this state is given by this kind of feature. On one mode, you have the superposition of, uh, for example, the absence, this vacuum, or the presence of single photon, one. And on the other side, and entangled to that, you have this coherent superposition of the coherent state and the coherent state with this uh, opposite phase. So how can we do this in the lab? And uh, we, we can use the same kind of scheme. And instead of starting from vacuum on both modes, input modes, we can start from vacuum on one side and with the coherent state on the other side. So again, by like seeing clicking this uh, detector here, it could have come from this mode. In this case, it would have a single photon at the output mode one and still the same coherent state on mode two or from the other one. In that case, you would have still vacuum on mode one and a photon added version of your initial coherent state in mode two. Now, as I've shown you at the beginning, uh, when you add a single photon to, to a coherent state, which is large enough, what you get is similar to a another coherent state of so slightly larger amplitude. So again, since these two processes can be made indistinguishable, you get you get a coherent superposition of these two possibilities. So one alpha and zero alpha prime, and it is this kind of state, which is exactly, well, not exactly yet, but if after some displacement in the second mode, you can get exactly the same form that I showed you before. So this hybrid microscopic uh, contribution, zero and one, and in principle, microscopic contribution, which is alpha and minus alpha. Well, for this kind of experiments, we didn't get really to the microscopic regime. So these alphas were quite small. So instead of talking about micro and macro entanglement, here it's better to talk about this hybrid, uh, discrete and continuous variable entanglement. Because essentially the first mode is uh, uh, can be described in a discrete variable setting just made of zero and one. And the second mode can be described in this continuous variable setting of, of coherent states, okay? And uh, so this paper was uh, came out in 2014 and uh, back to back with, with a similar paper by the group of uh, Julian Ra. And uh, so it's uh, very nice. And Julian has already told you a lot in the first uh, day of his conference about the possible use of this kind of uh, uh, hybrid continuous discrete variable uh, entanglement. And especially the fact that you can combine essentially uh, different encodings of quantum information, either the discrete variable encoding where uh, you have just a sort of binary um, and discrete uh, values for, for, for your, let's say, qubits. So essentially it's zero and one for your base states. And you can, so you can combine, for example, a network where some part of information is encoded in this discrete variable 
way with parts of the networks or memories or whatever, where the uh, information is quantum information and qubits are encoded in this uh, uh, continuous variable uh, way, essentially made of, uh, let's say, cat state encoding. And okay, uh, you've probably seen that Juliana they work, uh, worked quite a lot on this and, and from uh, swapping and teleportation and very nice stuff. Okay, let's go uh, back to, to, this, to, to, to this scheme again. So the, the one with vacuum on one side and quick state on the other one. So we can perform measurements, so we can get this reconstruct the density matrix, full density matrix of these two mode states. And uh, what we can do with this uh, experimental density matrices is to, to extract the um, entanglement of the state. Okay, entanglement that we can calculate by means of a negativity of a partial transpose here. And what we find experimentally in this, in this case was that, uh, okay, the entanglement goes down, the amount of entanglement decreases as you increase the size of this screen state here. And this is, uh, so these are experimental data, but the same, but this decrease is not due to, to, to losses or to, to some imperfection in the, in the experimental scheme. This is, I mean, expected. So what you, and this is not too surprising as no classicality seem to, to get smaller as you increase the, the size of a state that you, where you add a single photon. Also in this case, entanglement seems to, to get smaller and smaller as uh, you increase the size of the component of initial state, okay? But this is not entirely true. And I'm going to show you this in the next uh, example. So in this case, we perform another, uh, let's say, uh, a change, uh, another addition. I mean, it's not, an, uh, I don't want you to, to, to mess up with the words. So we, we, we change again the state. And then now what we have is two coherent states in two input modes, OK? And um, so in this case, OK, what we can do is to, again, perform this screen superposition of photon additions in principle with this variable phase phi that we can uh, control remotely in this uh, uh, herald uh, uh, modes here. And what you, can, what you get is this, uh, again, either a uh, an addition of a single photon on the first mode or an addition of a of single photon on the second mode. So if you look at this state and you can, uh, what you can do is to rewrite it a little bit and uh, differently. And what you find is that uh, it can be decomposed into different, uh, in a queen, in some of two different contributions. The first one, which is again, this one zero zero one uh, path entangled uh, single photon, which is entangled by the way, which is just displaced in phase space by an equal amount of uh, corresponding to this green state alpha uh, in both modes. So this state is entangled. And then there is also another contribution which is completely separable, which is just alpha one and alpha two, which is just your initial two mode states, two mode state. And the, the, let's say the relative contribution of these two uh, parts can be changed by essentially essentially just by changing this remote phase phi here. So in the case that phi is equal to pi, for example, this term just cancels out. So this separable part just disappears and you're left only with this entangled part. So you find something which is quite interesting and unexpected that if you set this phase, just by setting this phase properly, uh, you get, in, something which is always entangled. And if you calculate the negativity of the partial transpose of this uh, kind of state here, the one with the uh, uh, phi equal to pi, you find that this uh, uh, the entanglement stays constant at the maximum values value independently of the size of your input coherent state, of your input coherent states, both states. So this is interesting. So what you find is that you have a, you can have a high entanglement and a constant entanglement independently, regardless of the macroscopicity of the component states. So in principle, you can start from uh, large microscopic cohesion states. And just by sharing a single photon between the two, uh, you can entangle them in a way which is, uh, let's say, strong, I would say, okay? 
So this kind of um, state was uh, in particular the one with this uh, uh, pi uh, value here. So the one with uh, the end with the, with a minus in this coin superposition of one zero and zero one uh, was studied uh, theoretically a few years uh, before in 2012 uh, by, by a group of Nicolas Gisen. And they also showed that this kind of uh, entangled state is robust to losses, it's quite robust to, to losses, and uh, but it gets uh, more and more uh, sensitive to phase fluctuations, of course, when size increases. So uh, this brings me back to, to, to this uh, entanglement of microscopic and macroscopic uh, state. And back again in 2013, there were two back to back, back papers by the group of Nicolas Gisen and uh, Alex Lebowski, where they uh, essentially just uh, used uh, a, sort of a part of this uh, state here. So they started from this uh, the localized single photon, 1001, and then they just performed a displacement in uh, one of the two modes. Okay. And what they got, what we I mean, we call this uh, micro macro entanglement. So you see, this is a scheme. The scheme is very similar. Um, the, let's say concept scheme is similar for the two experiments. They generate a single photon, around the single photon, they split it on a bin splitter. So here we have this 1001 microscopic entanglement. And then they displaced by means of a, a strong coherent state, one mode of this uh, two mode state. So in this part here, you have this micro macro entanglement. But at the end, what they do, they, in order to, to measure state, they have to, to go back to the initial 1001 entanglement and just measure this by means of concurrence or tomographic reconstruction of the state. But in order to measure it, they have to destroy it. So, and then, okay, so this case, in these two cases, the state was a sort of micro macro entanglement. So only one mode was uh, moved to the macroscopic regime. What we want to do instead is having both modes in a macroscopic, uh, let's say, regime and then entangle them. So this uh, micro macro, uh, let's say, uh, entanglement was uh, uh, improved uh, just. Uh, couple of years ago again by the group of Alex Lewowski. And what they did in this case was to essentially add the displacement also on the other mode. So in that case, they had the macro macro entanglement, but just like before, the problem is that in order to, to, to measure, to analyze the final state, they had to undo the displacement. And so they had to essentially destroy the microscopicity and to go back to the, to the 1001 uh, kind of states to, to measure it. What we want to do instead is to, to keep the fully macroscopic, macroscopic uh, entangled state uh, alive, let's say, until the end and measure it completely. So this is a kind of, a, let's say, experiment that we perform. And uh, as, as I told you, we are working with temporal modes. So we have two coherent states at the input. We have this uh, herald mode, which, where we have two different paths of different lengths reaching this uh, heralding detector. So if uh, this uh, uh, delay here is equal to this, the delay between these two uh, incoming paths, by looking at, by getting a click here, you have a, you don't know if you're generated your single photon in the first mode or in the second one. And then you can adjust this phase here finally to, to, to finally control the, the superposition uh, of these two photon addition operations. And then we can add, we can also have, um, yeah, local oscillator to perform homotopy detection. And we also use some ultra-fast phase modulation to, to imprint different phases of these two local oscillator passes. So uh, if we want to, to really go to, to some macroscopic values of these, uh, let's say, of these uh, input Korean states, then you immediately find that there's the, a problem because uh, it, already if you start from something like alpha equal to seven, which is not so large, you find that on each, in each pulse, in each mode here, your mean number of photons is of the order of 50, which means that for a single mode, in order to reconstruct it in a, let's say, faithful way, you have to essentially at least reconstruct 75 by 75 density matrix elements. Then if you have considered two modes, so that's squared again. So in the end, you easily find that you need to reconstruct something like 30 million 
that's the metric metric elements to, to fully reconstruct those uh, two mode states, which is, I mean, prohibit, prohibitive uh, computational task as you go to, to some larger um, states. So how can we do this? How can we analyze the states nevertheless? So uh, we adopted uh, different strategies. One is to do, for example, randomize the global phase here, the oscillator or, or the state anyway. And what we find in this case is that, okay, you can, uh, some of the density matrix elements can be just, are just zero, so you don't need to reconstruct them. And so if you stay at a low mean number of photons, you can afford full reconstruction. And in this case, if you measure the uh, entanglement of the state, again, by negativity or partial transpose, what we find is that uh, you find entanglement and uh, even with a uh, randomized global phase case. But you can also do something else. And for example, you can just uh, think about the fact that the entanglement of this, um, this final state essentially is just a um, feature, entanglement feature such are, con are just contained in the correlated fluctuations in, of the quadratures in the two modes. So what we can do essentially is uh, to, 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 to uh, subtract the mean field uh, component of to, our quadrature distributions and uh, perform a full tomographic re reconstruction in sort of reduced Fox state uh, by sort of numeric high pass filtering of uh, our homodyne, homodyne data. And in this case, what we can do, we can go to much higher uh, mean number of photons and to still find significant amounts of uh, entanglement left in the state. So you see that here in this case, uh, uh, each of the two input Korean states has a mean number of photons of the order of about 60, and you still have a, a clear um, entanglement in this uh, final state. Uh, of course, you also see that, I mean, this curve goes down and it starts from 0.3 instead of uh, starting at one, like in theory, and it doesn't stay constant with half, with uh, size of the state, which is, uh, due to the fact that, I mean, this, uh, the, the states are now extremely sensitive to the preparation detection efficiencies. And in, as you can see in this sort of pictorial representation, we, we, we start from these large green states, which are initially completely uncorrelated and independent. And then by sharing a single photon by, between them, you get you sort of create this fragile entanglement. So you, uh, you see this glassy uh, shape of this uh, uh, link between these two Korean states, which is, I mean, we can resist however large is the state, but it's extremely sensitive to, to, to uh, perturbations. Uh, okay, let me go to the final part. So uh, this kind of so this states here is uh, mm, coherent states which are essentially entangled, which get entangled by sharing a single photon, have also some peculiar, peculiar joint photon number distribution um, dis distributions. So let's see what uh, kind of correlations you can have uh, in, a, in a general two mode states. Okay, state. So uh, if you plot the uh, joint photon number probability distribution is PN1 and 2 in the two modes, uh, on a split coherent state. So, so suppose you, you send a coherent state on a beam splitter, what, what comes out are two coherent states, which are not correlated. So what you get is something like this. And if you, so this is, these are the two marginal distributions that you obtain by integrating along rows or columns. And this is uh, the marginal distribution that you obtain by integrating along this diagonal, okay? Uh, so uh, the probability of getting of measuring a single uh, given number of photons in one mode is uh, essentially independent of what you get of the probability of measuring another number of photons uh, in, the, in the other mode. Okay, so in this case you have essentially uncorrelated uh, photon number measurements in the two modes. The situation is different if you start from a thermal state and you split it on a beam splitter. In this case you have some 
classical correlation. So you see it from here and you have some, let's say something more along the diagonal and you can also see it here where this, uh, the probability of getting the same uh, number of photons in the two modes is quite it's higher than, much higher than the others. While each uh, uh, mode has a, this uh, uh, thermal uh, distribution. You can have the opposite, well, I mean, you can go to the extreme uh, correlation. In the case of the two modes squeeze vacuum, in this case, you have still, I mean, if you look at the single modes independently, these marginals are just thermal distributions. But if you look at the two combined, what you find is that, uh, if you look at, the, again, around the, the diagonal here, what you find is that you have a, a maximum probability of finding the same number of photons in uh, both modes. So you only, if you find n photons in one mode, you have n photons also in the other one. And so you have perfect correlations. And then you can have a, another um, sort of extreme case where you have a delocalized single photon. So in the case of delocalized single photons, this is again, this 1001, if you measure one photon in one mode, you have zero on the other one and vice versa. But if you look at both photon, uh, just uh, one single mode at a time, you have an equal probability of getting zero or one. But you see that in this case, the kind of this of distribution along the diagonal is completely the opposite. In this case, you have uh, maximum probability at zero photon difference, photon number difference. And here you have zero probability at zero photon number difference. And this is anti-correlated. Now let's look at what happens with our um, photon added, uh, I mean, uh, two mode photon added coherent states. So this is the initial coherent states we start from, they're uncorrelated as I told you before, but if you add a single photon, you get something like this in the photo, joint photon number distribution. So what you see that uh, by adding a single photon in a localized way to these two coherent states, what you get is that you dig a vacuum, uh, sorry, a zero, uh, zero probability uh, diagonal here. So what you get is that after you coherently add a single photon to these uh, two previously uncorrelated coherent states, what you get is that, uh, uh, again, uh, the probability of getting a given number of photons in the two modes uh, independently is, uh, I mean, uh, is independent. I mean, you can get n photons in this mode or uh, m photons in the other, but the probability, probability of getting the same number of photons in the two modes is exactly zero. So this property was named uh, discorrelation, which is, uh, well, different from anti-correlation because anti-correlation is just between, let's say, two possibilities. In this case, you have many possibilities for the measured number of photons in each mode, but uh, still you get this, uh, that the probability of measuring the same number of photons in the two modes is zero. And you can also visually uh, see it better if again you look at this uh, um, the, uh, marginal, diagonal marginals, uh, but in the case of this uh, uh, separable and uh, uncorrelated coherent state as a maximum in this, along this diagonal, while in this discorrelated state, if you look at this uh, integrate along this uh, uh, diagonal, you get a minimum, you get zero essentially here. So a probability on getting of measuring the same number of photons that then equal to zero is zero. So what can this be used useful for? Well, let's go back to this, uh, um, let's say comparison between a perfectly correlated uh, two-mode squeeze vacuum. So in this case, again, you, you, this kind of correlation can be useful for, for example, for, uh, can, can be useful for many uh, quantum technology applications, but in particular for something like quantum key distribution schemes, where you want to share common random numbers, random keys. So you, you want to, to, to distribute uh, some random numbers to, to different parties, and you want to know that they are exactly the same for each of them. So what we are dealing with now is this delocalized single photon added green states, which is a perfect discorrelation, which means that uh, now we have this zero on the of the um, this marginal distribution, diagonal marginal distribution. And so what can it be useful for? Well, in what you can use it is to distribute 
unique randomness among parties. So instead of distributing uh, equal random numbers, you can distribute random numbers which are guaranteed to be different. And why can it be useful? Well, I for to, to give you just an example of why uh, of uh, how such kind of states of anti-correlation of discorrelation uh, properties can be useful. I can go back to the this paper in 1981 by uh, Shamir Rivest and Adelman, who were the ones who of the famous RSA, RSA um, cryptography scheme. Sorry. And they introduced the problem of this mental poker game. So the idea is that you want to play poker on, a, on the phone without using cards. And you want to do it in a fair way. And uh, playing mental poker is quite different from playing, let's say, mental chess. For if you have a, uh, in mental chess, you have a chessboard, and all the information is always available to all the parties. Um, instead, in the case of mental poker, what you have to do is to, to, to essentially um, each player should only access it by partial information, and they should trust that the cards have been dealt uh, in a very uh, fair way. So you see, this is, uh, by the way, this paper in 1981 is probably one, I, I think it's the first appearance of uh, Bob and Alice in the context of secure communications. And it's a very nice uh, paper. And so these two players, they just talk on the phone and they agree to, to play mental poker, but they, I mean, you really have to trust the car dealer in that case. So you can do it if uh, you don't trust the car dealer or you, you don't trust your opponent. So RSA, they essentially uh, introduce a scheme, a classical, uh, let's say, uh, solution to this problem by using commutative encryption, which is the possibility to, to retrieve a multiply encrypted message by performing the decryption operations in a different order. So just let me quickly show you how it can work. So you start from Bob having a private key, B, to encrypt uh, all the of the cards in the in the deck, uh, which are then scrambled in, in some way. Then he sends all the cards to Alice, who cannot know which card is which, because they're encrypted by Bob and she doesn't have a key. And Alice, what what Alice can do is to encrypt, to just choose, a, let's say, let's say that they just want to share one uh, card each. So uh, Alice can choose one card for Bob, and one card for herself. So she encrypts her card with the key A, which is unknown to Bob, and sends both cards to Bob. So you see one is just encrypted by Bob and the other one is encrypted by Bob and Alice. So what Bob can do is decrypt his one because he's got a key, but cannot decrypt the one that Alice chose for herself, herself because even if he removes his lock, it's, it is still locked by Alice key. So he sends this card back to Alice. And then at this point, they, each of them knows which uh, card he has. So they can announce that. And they can also share the keys in, so that they can check uh, that uh, everything has been done correctly. So this is a nice, uh, let's say, classical solution to this problem. Uh, the problem is that just like for the, um, the public key, key algorithm by RSA, it is essentially based on the uh, difficulty of some mathematical problem of factorization. So it's not 100% uh, uh, secure, it's just relies on some hard computational uh, problem. So what we can do instead by this uh, discorrelated state is that if we are we have one of these discorrelated multimode state, what we can do it is that it may naturally guarantee the uniqueness of various distributed random numbers. So, so you can just take these two, uh, let's say, queen states and uh, add a single photon in a, this uh, local way and send these two states now to Bob and Alice. And then each of them will, uh, we can perform a measurement on the number of photons in, in their modes and they're guaranteed to get a random and different uh, say, a card from the one chosen by the other. So let's see if this uh, works in practice. So these are the ideal 
uh, photo num joint photo number distributions for the states that we generate. And you see that as you increase uh, uh, the amplitude of the screen and state, uh, you get uh, you see very clearly this uh, zero diagonal here. So the probability of getting the same number of photons in the two modes is uh, always zero. And uh, so we can take the data uh, that I showed you for uh, the microscopic entanglement, and uh, we can analyze it in a different way. And so reconstruct this photo number, joint photo number uh, distributions. And what we find experimentally without just, uh, without correcting from any uh, error or inefficiency is uh, this kind of, uh, are these kind of distributions. And you see that, I mean, uh, it's not perfect. I mean, you don't have 100% discorrelation, but still you see this clear um, decrease along the diagonal. So this is a clear signature of uh, discorrelation and you can better see it by again, integrating uh, these uh, uh, experimental joint photo number distributions along the diagonal. And what we find is this clear, let's say, decrease. It doesn't go all the way down to zero because of this uh, again, limited uh, preparation and detection efficiency. But nevertheless, you see that if you include this in the model, this is exactly what we should expect. So this is uh, more or less all uh, I wanted to say. Also, my time is over. And so I wanted to, to conclude. So I've shown you that we can essentially uh, generate entanglement and discorrelation by uh, between states of uh, varying microscopicity by just sharing, by just performing this screen and superposition of uh, uh, single photon additions of the different modes. And this can be useful because, for example, I mean, just uh, generating entanglement uh, for on uh, between microscopic states of light can help you to study the coherence, uh, how the coherence uh, uh, behaves uh, versus the size of, uh, of your component states. Then, uh, I mean, these kinds of states could be used to, for, for some loss resilient entanglement distributions, can be used for quantum parameter estimation because of this extreme sensitivity to, to, to let's say, phase fluctuations. And as you are seeing now, you can also use them for also sharing some unique randomness between parties. What to do next, I mean, can we, how far can we go? Can we entangle much larger states of light? In that case, we need some, to develop some more efficient entanglement witnesses uh, to, to really, uh, for macroscopic non gaussian states. And then we really need to, to look better into the possible application for quantum information communication tasks. Uh, again, as usual, uh, I say that, I mean, what we mostly do are really some textbook type experiments and we really can do this sort of arbitrary, arbitrary engineering of quantum light states. So I always say that we play with quantum light, but this time, I mean, I really mean it. So we can really play cards now with, with this quantum light. So I think this is all and I want to thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs>